Okay, so now I want to go over some of the conventions that we're going to use in this, just for completeness. Um, the conventions here are the following. First of all, I'm going to tell you about the metric. We're going to be working in flat space in this particular course, and uh, which means that the inverse metric is the same as the metric. And I'm going to use the mostly minus metric. Okay. Now, this is the same as the one used by most QFT books, but not all of them. That's why I'm using it. Uh, it's the opposite one to the one I use in my own work. It is also not the aesthetic one. And as a result, everybody should be vigilant for minus signs. Okay. Now, we're going to mostly work in four space-time dimensions, but sometimes it's going to be helpful to keep the space-time dimension D arbitrary. And when I do, I'll try to be um, clear about this. D is going to be the dimension of space-time, mostly four. And um, a few other things. When I discuss four vectors, I will write them like this. X mu has a time component and a spatial component. So I here runs over one, two, and three, and is the spatial component. Okay. And uh, finally, I'm always going to set h bar equals to c equals to one. If we need them, they can be restored from dimensional analysis. So there's no loss of generality there. Okay, so let's now get started. I'm going to begin by just quickly reminding you of the things that you learned on how to apply path integrals to quantum mechanics from Madalena. So this is a brief quantum mechanics review. Most of this is just to establish notation. So in QFT 1 so far, you learned how to compute things in quantum mechanics using the path integral. In other words, you studied a Lagrangian, which looks like this. L is a function of Q and Q dot and say, you know, maybe it looks something like half q dot squared minus v of q. And then you took this and you stuck it into an action. So the action was the integral of the Lagrangian, q, q dot. And then you inserted this action, s, into a path integral to define a giant object called the generating functional. So that's a functional of the applied sources let me just remind you what this was. This thing looks like this. It's integral dq times the exponential times the exponential of i s of q plus i integral dt j of t q of t. There does not appear to be enough space there. Okay. So what are the ingredients entering here? D of Q is this philosophically uh, soothing but mathematically kind of distressing object, which is the integral over all functions. So this is the functional integral. It's the integral over all functions Q of T, which Madalena has told you about. This is this famous functional integral. And um, you furthermore learned how to use this to compute time-ordered Green's functions. So for example, suppose you want to calculate in the quantum theory the following object, q hat of tn, q hat of tn minus 1, and so on, times q hat of t1. Okay, so how do we compute this? Let me just call this object dot 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 for reasons of blackboard. This virtual blackboard is actually significantly smaller than a real blackboard. If I call it that, then it's equal to the following thing. It's equal to n times the integral dq q of tn q of tn minus 1 and so on times q of t1 times the exponential of isq. 
Okay? So in other words, we are doing the functional integral, but when we do that functional integral, we have factors of q in front of this exponential of the action. Now, an important point here was the following. An important point was that tn here is greater than tn minus 1, is greater than tn minus 2, and so on. In other words, this is really, really important, okay? Because on the left-hand side, remember we had some sort of quantum operator. Over there, the ordering of times matters. But on this side, it looks like it doesn't matter right? Because these Q's are just numbers that we're integrating over. So it looks like the order of these things doesn't matter. The way in which the quantum theory learns about the operator ordering is through the times, okay? In other words, what happens is you only get time-ordered correlation functions from this approach, okay? The path integral only gives you time-ordered correlation functions. So let me just emphasize that. In order to emphasize this, I will often put a t around the correlation function. So if I'm discussing the time-ordered correlation function, I'll often write something like this. q hat tn, q hat tn minus 1, and so on, times q hat t1. Okay? Where this t here indicates that it's a time-ordered correlation function. Okay. Now, another important point was that this quantity was actually pretty ill-defined, even by physicist standards. In particular, uh, what this means is that um, we're integrating over something which is purely exponential, so the integrals never converge. There's a way to fix that. The way in which you fix this is by doing something called wick rotation. Let me remind you what wick rotation is. So wick rotation is the following thing. What you do is you take your normal Lorentzian time, the time that we know and love, and we write it as minus i times tau, where this tau here is called Euclidean time. It's called Euclidean time. It's, why am I calling it that? Well, let's look at what happens to the metric. The metric used to be dt squared minus dx squared. It now becomes minus d tau square plus dx square. This overall minus sign isn't important. Notice the whole thing just now looks like it's a spatial Euclidean space. In other words, it now has a Euclidean signature. And that is why we call this tau Euclidean time. Okay. So what happens to the action? If you do the same game on the action, the action used to be is was equal to the integral d tau. So what I've done is I've just used the chain rule to replace every t with a tau. Okay, so you end up getting a new minus sign here and the relative sign between the potential and the kinetic terms switches. We often call this thing minus the Euclidean action. This is the Euclidean action. The important point here is that for reasonable choices of the potential, SE is positive definite. The Euclidean action is greater than zero. Okay? And this is great because when you do the path integral now, what you're actually doing is you're doing the following integral. And this integral actually does converge because we're not multiplying, we're not taking the integral of the exponential of something imaginary anymore. Now we're doing a perfectly ordinary integral over something that decays in the exponent, okay? So this integral now does converge. And this fact that we are secretly working, that we have to do a wick rotation to define things, um, means that in a very real sense, path integrals are only very well-defined if you're in Euclidean signature. 
there's something to keep in mind because um, you'll often be confused when you do your path integral. Often many of these confusions can go away if you remember that it only really makes sense. It's only well-defined in Euclidean signature, okay, after wick rotation. We'll see an example of this uh, in the very next section, actually. And finally, um, also, as has been explained in the first part, a related fact is that if you do this, this also guarantees that you are computing things in the vacuum state, okay? So I'll encourage you to take a look back at your notes from the first time. It's important that this prescription also guarantees we are in the vacuum. Okay. okay, so that ends this section. Next, we're going to move on to actually calculate something in quantum field theory using path integrals.